now it's time to uh, introduce Sharon Kyle. Sharon uh, has a law degree and she's the publisher of the LA Progressive along with her husband who she co-founded it with. And she served as a financial manager for many years with JPL and NASA. And um, it, was, it was when she was working for, for those organizations that she graduated from, from law school and is now a professor of law at the People's College of Law. She also sits on the board of the ACLU of Southern California and is on the editorial board of the Black Commentator. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, typically, uh, when I speak, I generally don't have notes, but today I do. So I'm going to see how I can do this, how I can just uh, kind of read my notes and speak to you at the same time. First, let me thank the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom for inviting me to join in celebrating International Women's Day. And I'd like to really extend a special thank you to Grace Aaron for inviting me. <laughs> really, really an honor. And Grace, I, I don't know if you understand how much of an honor it was for me to receive that invitation. It was both an honor and a surprise. And it was a surprise um, because usually when I'm asked to give a talk or if I'm interviewed, the topics I'm tapped for are race, um, progressive media, civil rights, civil liberties, those kinds of issues. Um, so Grace has already mentioned that I'm a professor of law, so naturally I would be asked to speak on issues of civil rights and civil liberties. I'm a professor of law. Um, I pro publish a progressive magazine. So of course people would ask me about independent media and progressive media, and I'm always willing to talk on that issue. Um, obviously, I'm black. Um, <laughs> well, you know, the, 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 my husband and I have this running joke. Whenever someone wants a speaker for veterans' issues and they think about contacting Dick and Sharon, they often ask Dick if he would speak on veterans' issues, naturally, because he's a veteran. But when they think of the two of us and the topic is race, they call on me naturally, because I'm the one that belongs to a race. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's our joke. I mean, isn't that kind of funny? You know, it was like one of the things I learned when I married my husband uh, more than 13 years ago, it became apparent to me that he actually doesn't belong to a race because whenever the issue is race, everyone looks at me. <laughs> so Grace's invitation and to a great extent my surprise at being invited did two things. It caused me to do some self-examination because I hardly ever address women's issues. And so I just told you that I'm a professor and I'm an African American and I am a publisher of a magazine. Not once did I mention, even though it's obvious I'm an African American, it's just as obvious, I hope, that I'm a woman. <laughs> but I didn't mention that. And so my surprise forced me to really do some serious self-examination and it put a spotlight on the ways in which intersectionality has bifurcated my sense of self and also my feeling that I have the freedom and the voice to speak on particular issues. Now I don't really have answers for this but I think that one of the keys to the women's movement, the progressive movement as a whole, is we have got to break down the racial barriers. That is where our strength lies. And that's all I'm going to say on that, except to say that of all the things I mentioned, I didn't mention being a woman, and I thought of Sojourner Truth, who so eloquently said, ain't I a woman? So I looked at myself through the lens of being a woman and being a feminist because, because of Grace's invitation. And I started to think and look back in the recesses of my mind, when did my awakening to feminism occur? So although I remember the 60s, 
I actually am really a child of the 70s. So I was a little kid uh, in the 60s, and I do have some memories. In fact, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, that was the day that he was assassinated was the first time that I remember hearing about Martin Luther King. I didn't know who he was. Now, I was a kid, and um, for many years I was upset with my parents that they didn't tell me anything about Martin Luther King, but they didn't think to talk about those issues with a kid. So I just say that to say that I wasn't really um, aware during the 60s. I knew about Vietnam, but the Vietnam War was over by the time I was in junior high or high school. So as a young person, I explored ideas of joining several different radical activist groups. Um, like I said, Vietnam was over by the time I was in junior high or high school. The women's movement wasn't getting the kinds of headlines um, for, for my generation as it did for my husband's generation. Uh, the civil rights marches were, had all but ceased. So there really wasn't a place for me to explore my activism or my feminism. And then I made a decision uh, that ultimately changed the direction of my life. I decided to become a mother. So I had two children pretty early on in my life, and unexpectedly I became a single mother. And I found myself needing an income. And that's how I stumbled upon NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It became a temporary, it started as a temporary job. I did it just to make some money, but I learned shortly thereafter that there were some fascinating things going on in the world of science. And the people I worked with liked me. So what started as a temporary assignment and simply a mechanism of putting food on the table became a 20 plus year career. So for all those years, I was a member of several space flight teams, space flight projects that most of you have heard of. The Mars Pathfinder Project, uh, the Magellan Mission to Venus, the Voyager Mission, uh, the uh, Galileo mission, and finally the Genesis mission, which was a sample return mission that um, culminated in a wonderful crash <laughs> into the desert floor of Utah in, in the year 2008. So my responsibilities there included securing funding for these missions. So I was a member of the core team, and what I did was help the scientists and engineers develop their budgets, help them adhere to their budgets, and I also would pitch annually to NASA headquarters in order to get more funding. And it was really exciting and heady stuff. I, I gotta tell you, some of my best years as a member of an organization was working with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Now the first, 10 years, I was relatively young, I felt privileged, and I still feel a bit of privilege, as being a member of a space flight project team. I felt that my opinions were, um, were honored, I felt that the recommendations that I made to the project were heard, and I felt like I was really a core team member, and it was fantastic. But later, after the first 10 years, the key person who I worked with, the, the, the uh, project manager, retired. And I began to see that what I felt was an egalitarian, uh, a place of freedom where brilliant minds came together to do some phenomenal things, a lot of what I saw was the result of a benevolent leader. This man was a wonderful leader, and to this day, he is a very close friend of mine. But after he, was, after he left, I begin to see some of the things that Carol, just a little while ago, she talked about how California is so entrenched in militarism. I began to see a sort of a parallel universe at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I saw sexism and racism and transphobia and homophobia and ableism. I noticed for the first time, I guess because my benef my uh, beneficial leader was gone, I noticed for the first time that the upper management was 100% white males. This organization, when I began working there, had 10,000, uh, a workforce of 10,000. 
during the Clinton administration, there was a uh, funding cuts. And so because of a shortage of resources, they started letting people go. Well, let's see. I wonder who got let go first. <laughs> <laughs> so I started, I began to see that this organization that had such a fabulous reputation for doing phenomenal things like not just exploring the universe, but they did some things that resulted in the discovery of um, MRIs, which are magnetic resonance imaging that we use today in medical, in, in med many medical technologies. These are some of the unintended beneficial consequences of having scientists and engineers with almost unlimited funding to do research. Wonderful things came out, but just as there were wonderful things, there were some awful things. And as resources became tighter, our mission, which was to support NASA, began to shift, and start, I was starting to see more and more Department of Defense contracts. And I thought, what is this about? Now, at the same time, my children were becoming independent. And I started to explore my own self. So this was my awakening. I mentioned not really being aware in the 60s. Well, everything I missed in the 60s, I learned at JPL. I learned about the need for these movements. I learned about my desire to live in a fair, egalitarian society. And I wanted to understand how to make that happen. So it was those experiences also that taught me that technological advances alone will get us nowhere. We have got to couple those technological advances with an embracing of the feminine. I found over and over again abuses from the top where the bottom ranks, the lower ranks were exploited. So that time at JPL eventually prompted me to go to law school. It prompted me to set up and establish the LA Progressive with my husband, Dick Price. And so for more than 10 years, I have devoted myself to progressive activism. I just kind of threw myself out there once the kids, my, my son is now a teacher, LAUSD, my daughter is an attorney and she lives in Washington, D.C. So once the kids graduated from college and graduate school, I went to law school. And I was able to pay for it from my salary that I was earning at JPL, but I was very interested in being a people's lawyer, not a corporate lawyer. And so I threw myself into that. I threw myself into the ACLU, the NAACP, um, the Progressive Caucus of the Democratic Party. I was an elected member of the board there. But as much as I worked, all of those organizations, even the most well-meaning, were almost 100% head, headed by men. And that imbalance, it made me see feel like, what the heck am I doing? It, I'm beginning to feel like what I'm doing is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Every time I turn around, we got another war. We have another shooting of an unarmed black man. Global warming is fast approaching the point where maybe we've reached the point of no return. We have enough nuclear weaponry that we can destroy the Earth 10 times over. What the heck are we doing? So that's where I was. And then, and, and feeling quite like all of this effort is futile. What am I doing here? But again, I didn't think about a Nile woman. So I'm going to tell you a story. When Grace called me, I struggled for days, maybe even weeks after the call, what am I going to say that is hopeful, that could have meaning for these people who have worked so tirelessly in this area? I really didn't know very much about your organization. I knew it existed, and I knew that Jane Addams was one of the original founders, and in fact, Jane Addams was one of my heroes. I had Jane Addams' biography, so I started reading it, and I was just pulling information from everywhere. Um, I listen to lots of bell folks who talks about us being a first world imperialist capitalist patriarchy. So yeah, we know all the problems, but what about the solutions? 
And then Nina Simons, who's the founder of Bioengineers, bio says of all the measures that we take, the legislative actions, the policy, awareness of environmental issues, all the things that we do, none of these amount to a hill of beans until we start to embrace the feminine and we have some balance at every level of society, masculine, feminine balance. So another area in my search to understand, well, how do we do this? I started reading a lot about primates and the work of Jane Goodall. Now initially, when we first started, started studying primates, we used to believe that human beings were the only savagely violent species in the primate family. But after Jane Goodall, she found out that that was just not true. That there are other primates that kill their others, their, their family members, males kill, females kill, some use their tool making skills to fashion more effective killing tools. Other primates even engage in what can only be called warfare. Well, that sounds pretty damn sad. And it leads to this, it led me to feel demoralized. But a few months ago, my daughter sent me an article that just blew my mind. The name of the article was The Garbage Dump Truth. I don't know how many of you know the story of the garbage dump truth. There's a team of researchers studying a troop of baboons that lived in a region where there was a lot of tourism. And because there was a lot of tourism, there were many restaurants. Well, this troop of baboons had taken to using the garbage dump as their main source of, of uh, food. Now these baboons, particularly the alpha A males, were quite vicious, extremely territorial, and cruel to one another, especially the lower ranking males and the lower ranking females, which by the way, all of the females were considered low ranking to the alpha males. So the alpha males would dominate. They go to this garbage dump and they take all the best of the best. And nobody else better not challenge them, not, not even attempt to challenge them without experiencing their wrath. Over time, this garbage dump became um, the place where the restaurant industry started putting rancid meat. And this rancid meat, which was a place that the the wonderful foraging place for these alpha males, this rancid meat caused them to have a certain type of disease that eventually killed them all. So, now, I'm not suggesting. <laughs> However, I will say this, when all of the alpha males were gone, there was an immediate change in the dynamic of the group dynamics. The females that were all considered lower ranking had to move in and fill in the gap. So there still was hierarchy. Hierarchy was still there. But it was hierarchy that was infused with feminine energy. The females shared their hierarchy, hierarchical places with the lower ranking males. As a whole, the troop became more collaborative and cooperative. There was a reduction almost to the point of zero of warring types of activities. And what fascinated me more than anything else was this change in culture lasted for years. And any other baboon that became adopted into the garbage dump troop, they took on the characteristics of the culture of the garbage dump troop that still to this day, 15 to 20 years later, is still an egalitarian troop of baboons. Well, that 
That is what made me feel like, hmm, maybe we can learn something from them. Maybe we're not destined. And sometimes it feels like we're living and we're just headed toward the precipice of annihilation, whether it be via nuclear war, or global warming, or water shortage, or all or not to mention what Monsanto and, and all the others are doing to us with our environment and our food. But all of those organizations are run by those alpha males. We need the feminine energy. And I'd like to thank you so much for having me here today, because I feel like I can now plug into this organization that I knew about, but I just wasn't connected because of the intersectionality of race and gender. We have got to break those walls down, and I think that we can have the same kind of power that those female families had. Thank you.